So welcome, Raghu, to, uh, to our uh, webinar. A quick introduction, because there are a lot of people who are probably not their customers of Scriptbox. Uh, my name is Atul Shinghal. Um, I have the privilege of being the host for today's webinar. Uh, we've been running these expert speak webinars over the last four or five months, uh, uh, post sort of the COVID uh, beginning, uh, talking to people in the industry, talking about investments. Uh, we decided in the spirit of independence and freedom uh, to have somebody special and different talk to us about uh, freedom from worry. Uh, so typically we talk about it in the context of money. Uh, I requested uh, Raghu uh, to, to talk about what he thinks about it. Uh, given his army connections and his experience in, in the corporate world, uh, it's, uh, we'd love to hear from him uh, and about his learnings, his experiences, uh, what can we, what can we as uh, practitioners uh, uh, this is a time of crisis, uh, but uh, as the going gets tough, the tough uh, get going, and Raghu embodies that. So, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Raghu to talk through his experiences. I might ask a couple of questions, and the audience is welcome to post any questions in the Q and A or in the chat window, and uh, post uh, the initial conversation with Raghu. I'll throw those questions. Uh, uh, to him for him to share his experiences with you. Thank you very much. And I'll talk a little bit about Stripbox uh, during the course of the presentation. Thank you very much. All over to you. Thanks a ton, uh, Atul. Thank you for this opportunity. The first day, I want to tell all the listeners that uh, in the spirit of a crisis, we were originally planning to do a presentation that you would have seen a, a PPT on and I would have been speaking. But uh, because of the heavy rains in Bombay and because of a couple of other issues during the tech check, we realized that if we use the presentation, it's going to slow down for everybody. So I'm going to use the presentation more as a reminder for myself and uh, just talk on those points uh, which uh, are there in the presentation. So let me begin by first, uh, you know, acknowledging that all of us, you know, regardless of uh, which sphere of uh, profession we are in, where we are working, we are all afraid. We are all afraid of a crisis. And matter of fact, fear is not such a bad thing. Uh, incredibly, fear, I have always considered, I mean, not just me, but philosophically, fear is actually a gift. Now, the reason for that, uh, Atul, if you just put yourself in mute, but because I'm getting a loop back from you. Yeah, there is a. All right. So <laughs> if you look at the evolution of human beings, and you say that uh, when you study prehistoric history and you see how human beings evolved over a period of time, we evolved. Uh, as you are aware, from uh, uh, the Darwinian theory, we have evolved, our brains have evolved generation after generation. Every feature that allowed us our, or our ancestors, great ancestors to survive was a feature that was promoted. And every feature in our uh, genetic um, sort of making, which was detrimental to us, was weaned away. So let me give you in a very you know anecdotal example. Let's say during evolution, there were two tribes. I'm simplifying it, of course. But let's say there was tribe one, which was a very brave tribe, consisted of very brave people. Uh, when they would see a saber to tiger or a mammoth, they would you know, decide to attack it by themselves. Or, for example, if they saw a big crevice, they would run up to the crevice and hope to jump across. Or they would, they would see a bright red fruit and they would eat that even if they've never seen it before. And let's say there is another tribe which is actually much more afraid. Now, this tribe does not, when it sees a mammoth, the, the, the person realizes that I can't take on this mammoth by myself. I need to go back, get more help, and then come back again. Or if they see a, a crevice, they would say, I'd rather walk down and come up to the other side. Similarly, if they saw a very bright red fruit, which they have seen in their life before, they would prefer not to bite into it and prefer to give it to an animal to see what would happen. So very, very cautious tribe. So there is a tribe A, which is a fearless tribe, and there is a tribe B, which is a cautious tribe. Whose descendants do you think we all are? Tribe A or tribe B? Tribe B, tribe A did not have descendants. They all died. So when you look at evolution, gift, the, the fear that we feel is actually a gift. And let me explain this to you in another way. When born, there are three primal emotions that all human beings have hardwired into them. And matter of fact, not just human beings, every living creature. If a creature is living today, it has three hardwired emotions sort of sort of welded into the genetic DNA. The first is, of course, hunger, because without food, uh, you cannot. The baby, when it is born, the first thing it seeks is food. The second is fear. 
it because it is fear that keeps us away from danger so if you look at the evolution of our brain the human brain has evolved into what is called three different parts of course i'm oversimplifying everything over here so if there are any you know medical uh, people listening to it don't don't um, sort of uh, criticize me on this i'm making it very very simple the first brain is called the reptilian brain it's called the reptilian brain because we shared it with reptiles and if you want to know where it is in your head if you made a fist like this and if this was your brain this is where the reptilian brain would be the reptilian brain is the one that handles all the functions like breathing eating uh, if i were to throw something at you you would immediately move out of the way this is all being done by the reptilian brain the middle brain which evolved much later is much more to do with emotions likes dislikes it 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 gives us the, the feeling of love the feeling of affection the feeling of uh, ownership it all comes from the mid brain and finally the third part of the brain is called the neocortex and the reason why it's called the neocortex is because new brain neocortex which means it developed just a few uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of years ago but this is the last part of the brain to develop this is the part which the frontal lobe which allows us to make decisions so uh, which allows us to compare funds and pe ratios and all of these calculations this is done by the frontal brain but whenever there is an emergency whenever there is a crisis whenever you feel afraid our genetic dna takes us back to the reptilian brain and there's a good reason for that let's say you are going into a deserted building after the rains and you open the door and suddenly some rope like thing falls on your shoulder what do you think will happen do you think the neocortex will decide let me take a look at this rope whether it's a rope or a snake or do you think the instant response will be handed over to the reptilian brain which will immediately do a jhatka like that and you will get out of the way so whenever a human being is afraid they actually take their the thinking goes back to the reptilian brain and this is a very important aspect to remember that as we are exposed to a fearful situation a lot of our logical thinking goes out of the window so many times when we teach people to be in crisis when we teach people to be in a fearful situation or an unknown situation so one of the most fearful situations is the one that is unknown to you and that is why when you land in a new country or you are in a new locality or you are in a new group of people you are much more fearful and it takes a little bit of opening up and familiarity before which i mean let me give you a very simple example which all of us may identify with i'm hoping all of us will identify remember the first ever time you went into a five star hotel first time you know you are very like waiter na puch le kya kar raha hai yahan pe no it was almost like that and today you walk into that place as if you own that place what happened that was a new experience to you and when it became familiar it became okay so the unfamiliar is always something that we are afraid of now which means that when a crisis like this happens which is happening to us right now with the covid or the 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 belief that things may go wrong or the fear that things may go wrong our sense our our thinking starts going back to a reptilian brain and that is something that we have to be cautious of so there is no shame in saying that i experience fear because fear is actually a gift fear tells you that a you are a human and you are alive and b it prepares you to handle a matter of fact if i had a team and half of them were of the opinion that this covid show where ho jayega 3 4 mahine mein we will go back to business as usual there is nothing to worry about and the other team which says hey listen this might be a paradigm shift and if i am overestimating maybe i am wrong but i'd rather react as if that piece of rope is a snake than to react as if it is a rope and it turns out to be a snake now that is the human dna the human dna is geared to assume the worst case scenario it is a genetic evolution of us so the two points i want to illustrate first one fear is a gift there is nothing to be afraid of two when we are in fear we should be cognizant of the fact that our thinking brain surrenders the control to the reptilian brain and that is something that we need to be cautious about and we need to bring the control back to the thinking brain and matter of fact it is said in another way in many many books and they say a hero is a person who is brave for just 5 minutes longer that's it so if a person is able to control that fear and think rationally think what decisions were taken with a logical part of the brain how do those decisions change just because it's a crisis it should not change just because it's a crisis and you suddenly start getting control of the uh, uh, of the thinking brain over the reptilian brain so this is one of the points that i wanted to sort of talk about 
the uh, second element i wanted to cover is that you you i'm certain you have heard of the maslow's uh, theory of uh, hierarchy of needs so abraham maslow propagated, propagated this theory that all human beings have a hierarchy of needs it's also known as the maslow's pyramid and at the base of the pyramid you have the physiological needs water food survival uh, you know warmth clothing sleep uh, sexual reproduction it's it's is actually something that we share with all animals it's not something which is unique to humans it's every animal has that at the next level you have what is called the safety needs personal security employment resources health uh, property all of that and after the the next level is love affection caring friendship intimacy belonging to something belonging to a tribe and the level after that is self esteem where you want to be you know respected you want to be a ceo you want to be a a, a big man you want to be the society president those are the you know uh, things which make you feel school captain whatever it is in your in your own uh, you know in your own uh, Uh, environment and finally comes uh, self actualization which is you want to give back to the community you want to leave a legacy you want to be remembered as a person who did good for other people so this is in short the maslow's uh, uh, pyramid but when crises happen when danger threatens then human beings will immediately revert back to the lowest two bases which is physiological needs remember as soon as this uh, covid crisis hit how many people started hoarding food that is going straight from self actualization uh, a person who was willing to you know share things with other people willing to give away and willing to be suddenly goes back to hoarding you know uh, uh, toilet paper <laughs> and hand washers and all of that where does that come from it comes from the fact that when in danger we plummet straight from the self actualization to the self esteem to the love and belonging right up to the safety needs so this is something that we need to be aware of we need to be aware of our own behavior during the times of the crisis and it's perfectly okay it's okay because we are human beings and human beings are expected to behave like that now the third point i want to share with you is contrary to our belief <coughs> man is not a rational animal man is a rationalizing animal now let me explain that to you what does that mean human beings usually take most of their decisions with the gut most of the decision they take with the gut and they later on justify that with a lot of logic so i'll give you a very simple problem this is a this is a age old uh, experiment it's called the linda experiment you can google it up and you can try it on your friends it's a, it's a very interesting experiment so the experiment goes something like this i'm going to read out one line to you just one line to you one sentence to you and that is describing a woman called linda and after describing that person i'm going to ask you a question and you just have to answer that question based on the sentence that i've just asked you so let me read out that uh, a sentence for you so here's how it goes Listen carefully. Linda is a 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright woman. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. I'll read that again. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also. participated in an anti nuclear in anti nuclear demonstrations question is which is more probable a linda is a bank teller linda is a bank teller and b linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement so the first uh, uh, option is that linda is a bank teller and the second option is linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement now when you ask this question of people uh, by and large most of the people uh, feel that linda is not just a bank teller and is also active in the feminist movement but remember the question the question is which is more probable a or b now the sentence b actually contains the sentence a sentence b says that linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement so the chances of sentence b happening are definitely lower than the chances of sentence a 
but the human mind doesn't think logically the human mind immediately makes up an image makes up a narrative and says with this additional information although it seems illogical i would still go for a illogical and a irrational decision and that's all that's okay too there is nothing to be uh, you know sort of ashamed about it because uh, a human brain actually maybe some other day we'll discuss it in detail we actually have more than 24 25 different biases i'm just going to read out a few of them so firstly is the availability heuristic bias which uh, all of us are familiar with right now uh, availability heuristic is uh, something that uh, is very very obvious uh, in these days when we are constantly our mind is plagued with covid casualties people are dying of covid people are dying 600 people died do you know that every day in india more people die of hunger than tuberculosis aids and uh, many of the diabetes many of the diseases put together now the world is looking for a, a antidote or a, or a vaccine for uh, covid and more people die in emerging countries of hunger every day than all the diseases put together and for hunger there is a vaccine it's called food but we don't look at that space what we look at is wherever there is much more availability of information and we start believing giving it much more weightage than what the numbers actually uh, warrant similarly i'll give you a couple of other examples uh, one example i wanted to give you because it comes from the financial industry and this is a bias called the outcome bias the outcome bias is uh, you don't care about the methodology so long as the outcome is correct so in case let's say you you follow some process by which you you do an analysis of uh, distribution of portfolios looking at uh, uh, your your uh, needs and after all of that analysis you arrive at buying a certain set of uh, assets and let's say sake of argument the assets lose their value the outcome bias uh, immediately labels that entire process as a bad process even though if the process is not bad the result the outcome has been bad similarly it also could be the other way around that you do something which has no process maybe you just toss a coin or you throw a dart or you go to you know a fortune teller and that person gives you an advice which turns out to be true our belief in the process gets uh, ratified regardless of the fact whether the so the the outcome orientation uh, disguises the fact that the process itself may be flawed so there are many such biases about 20 25 such biases and these biases also are accentuated during a time of fear and during a time when we have consequences so let me explain this to you with another example if uh, if uh, i asked you to walk on a chalk line let's say i made a chalk line on a floor and i asked you to walk on that chalk line i'm pretty sure that all of us would you know sort of balance ourselves and we'd walk on that chalk line but if that chalk line uh, or a plank of wood was placed on top of two skyscrapers now suddenly uh, we are very very afraid but why should that be the width of the plank is exactly the same the width of the rope is exactly the same if you could walk on a plank on the floor why can't you walk on the same plank with the same width on top of us because the consequences change and just because the consequences have changed you start questioning your base decision all over again and that is why this sense of panic which happens and atul and you and i were talking the other day that whenever people are afraid they immediately want to gather all the resources that may be spread out physically somewhere else and consolidate it as fast as possible this is human nature so we need to be cognizant of how human beings behave when they are under fear because it make it 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 drives us and by the way this is not just you and me one of the most famous examples i wanted to quote over here actually this is the time i'm missing my slide was uh, sir isaac newton uh, many of you may may know or may not know this is that in 19, 1719 there was a major uh, bubble which was called the south seas bubble this was uh, another story it was set up uh, a venture was set up by a bunch of uh, british lords to float a company a uh, very famous story anyway long and short of it is like the tulip uh, uh, bubble or like the several other bubbles that have happened in the past this one was the south uh, seas bubble and they floated this stock and a gentleman no less than sir isaac newton he fell for it he bought his entire put his entire life savings into it and the stock shot up shot up shot up 
he got out of the stock when he thought that he had made about seven or eight times but the stock continued to shoot up and sir isaac newton again reinvested in it did something which happens every day in, in the in the streets in the lal street every day it happens he again reinvested while the stock was at the top and he lost his entire life savings in the stock in the south uh, sea bubble so much so that he is very famously uh, quoted to have said that i can understand the movements of the heavenly bodies in the in the cosmos but i can't understand the way human beings behave when they are in a crisis and that is uh, absolutely true for uh, and one other thing we need to remember the last point i want to talk about is that when we are faced with a emergency situation with a with a fearful situation emotion takes over a logic and i'll i'll tell you this uh, famous experiment which i have also done uh several times with uh, my audiences and, and you can do it with your own teams or even you can try it at home uh this was done by a professor called uh, Walter Levin and uh, he 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 to teach physics in a very interesting manner so what he does is he gets his uh, students to stand uh, under a rope uh, on which they, uh, uh, on a pendulum think of it as a pendulum of a of a steel rope and at the end of which there is an iron ball it's a it's a big iron ball and uh what they do is they ask the student uh, they ask a volunteer student to come forward the volunteer comes forward and uh, the good professor makes the person stand some distance away from the ball and then takes the ball and brings it very close to the student's chest or to the shoulder and then releases the ball so everybody knows physics you know physics um, that energy cannot be created or lost so this pendulum if it touches my shoulder and it swings to the other end when it swings back it should just touch my shoulder that's it because no energy can be created and it works perfectly and the student stands there laws of physics work the student is absolutely fine the ball goes away comes back and touches his shoulder no problem for the second instance of the same experiment everything is same exactly the same except now the professor turns the student and brings the pendulum to the teeth of the student to the face and places it there and releases it physics is same everything is same the ball is same the pendulum is same but this time when the pendulum comes back 99 out of 100 people will move their head away and why does that happen it's exactly the same the, the 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 calculations are the same the reasons why you put the money in the stocks are the same everything is same but as soon as you feel something can go wrong you know nothing can go wrong physics tells you that suddenly the pendulum cannot get energy out of somewhere but that impossible fear also forces an individual to move his head out of the way so the first aspect i wanted to kind of drill down in this part of uh, uh, my conversation with you is fear is nothing to be ashamed of fear is something that is good and in a crisis it's nice to have a, a, a light edge of fear matter of fact you mentioned the army days and and you know brother is uh, atul in the army uh you can check with most of the people who have been in combat and they'll tell you that when they are in combat there is that nice i wouldn't say nice but there is that edge that you have in your stomach your heart is beating slightly faster than normal your 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 senses are much more heightened everything seems to be moving much slower than what it moves normally because you are in a heightened state of fear and that is good it is not bad however the flip side to that is we must also know that fear at times forces us to take without our knowledge it compels us to take decisions which are contrary to what rational mind should do which is contrary to what the smart thing to do is and uh, since we were talking about uh, the investments and uh, you know assets and all of that i very often and i don't know much about finance you're aware of it but i very often ask uh, people that if the base parameters have not changed uh, why should your decision change just because some elements of the environment have changed and even as a complete novice uh, uh, on the stock market assessments i am aware that it is only during these times that uh, opportunities really arise and you know one of the uh, one of the best examples that uh, i can give for this uh, in in some senses I, i don't know how many of us know this that the, ironically the chinese word for danger or crisis and opportunity the symbol is exactly the same so and 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 i think there is a lesson there there is a lesson there because uh, in the last 3 months uh, uh, of course many many interesting things have happened but i just want to point out two things which which will probably uh, so in the last 3 months a company called zoom 
which most of us had never ever heard about i had not heard about zoom i had heard about cisco telepresence i had heard about uh, uh, skype and and uh, some of the other terms. zoom i had never heard about zoom's valuation has increased more than the seven top airlines of the world zoom is now worth more than seven of the largest airlines in the world check it out and we work uh, the very big uh, co-working sharing company, which you start, you saw, you know, just before COVID and springing up in every town, every place, it dropped from an $8 billion valuation to less than $3 billion in a matter of three months. So this is the way the world is changing. So when the world changes like this, that's the time opportunities actually arise. And, and opportunities are not just for uh, uh, sort of making money, but opportunities which uh, many people would have never thought of behaviors will change. Customer behaviors will change forever. Customers who were very of online shopping, not because of credit card, they just said, yeah, how can I buy a shirt without trying it on? Are uh, suddenly buying shirts saying I could order six, keep one, send back five. Now, this behavior change is unlikely to go back just because COVID goes away or a vaccine is invented. A lot of changes. And in a way, Atul, you know this as well, and I think many of our listeners know this, that many of these changes were going to happen anyway. COVID yeah. just fast forwarded it to us. There is threat. Automation was happening. Artificial intelligence was happening. A lot of the work was being shifted out. Low value work was being shifted out to machines. That was happening. We were very clearly seeing uh, uh, headcount being cut in organizations. So a lot of these things were already happening. It's not like COVID came and did something that was completely, of course, it accelerated the process and, and it made it uh, what would have normally taken maybe about three to five years. It, it made it happen in about three to five months. But these changes were due to happen. So in many ways, our way of thinking, our way of leading, our way of uh, living life uh, needed to change uh, uh, as well. And, and sort of COVID made it happen. Thanks, Raghu. So I mean, uh... Uh, I, I don't know if you uh, how you how you manage so much content at such pace. I think even the listeners are struggling to catch a breath, uh, leave alone the, assimilate all that you've said. But every point is absolutely valid. So not for the sake of drawing a parallel, but to our customers, uh, we always say uh, yes, have fear uh, because fear and greed are the two key drivers of of uh, of markets. Uh, but uh, follow process. I mean, don't be outcome driven because oh, that standard question, "Kitna deti hai?" Uh, is the wrong answer. <laughs> the, the idea is just follow process, and without plugging mm. box too much, uh, we are just believers in process. Uh, I like Raghu said. I come from army background. Uh, my father, General Shingle, God bless his soul. My elder brother, who's in the army, and his Raghu's friend. Uh, we always sort of said, just be disciplined about process, and we believe believe that in script box. Uh, so. To, to our customers and to people who are listeners, uh, from our perspective, what uh, Captain Raghu has said, that uh, fear is a good thing, but uh, don't let it influence what you do. Don't get in suddenly, don't get out of markets, stay the while, uh, and yeah, if you have questions, ask, ask us. So Raghu, I'll pass it back on to you. Uh, somebody asked, asked a question, uh, is it possible to live without bias? Uh, so No, not at all. So uh, no, so it's not possible to live without bias. It's not possible to live without fear, but you should be cognizant of both. Uh, so just like when you become a, like I'll give you my favorite example of fear. And I think um, uh, this example will help all of us for things other than COVID also. Most of us are afraid of public speaking. You would have realized that, that when you're asked to speak. And so you, maybe you're sitting in a dinner table and telling your friends about something. And suddenly someone says, why don't you stand up and tell the whole hall and you freeze, right? You would experience that. Most of us would have experienced that, that in front of a large audience, we suddenly become afraid. Matter of fact, the fear of public speaking is supposed to be the number one fear of many, many human beings. Number two fear is death. So think about the irony. You would rather be the person inside the coffin than the one reading the eology of that person inside the coffin. It's that, that's the irony of fear. And what has happened? What, what happens when you go in front of an audience, when you have to speak in front of an uh, audience or something like that? You, you, your, your hand gets uh, moist, your, your throat becomes parched, your heartbeat increases in its uh, pace, and you get butterflies in the stomach. And, and you also want to go to the loo again and again and again. Remember? For that big conference or the big meeting in front of the board, you are presenting, waiting in the waiting room. You want to go to the loo again and again. Now, why does this happen? Why does this happen? So fear triggers a series of biological reactions in, inside our body. This is not something we can control. We just can't control it. 
So fear is is uh, uh, you you the human body your human mind responds to fear in three ways. There is fight, uh, flight, or freeze. So freeze is what we do first. Uh, remember, you go to a friend's house and suddenly a big dog comes rushing towards you. You become statue. You don't move around. You become statue straight away like that because that is your prehistoric brain telling you that when a predator is approaching you, be still, don't move around. We also learnt it in school that whenever the teacher is looking very angrily about who's done it and all, you don't even meet the gaze. You look your Put your eyes down because you know that the moment I meet the gaze, the predator will seek me out. So that is freeze. The second option is to either fight or to run, fight or flight. Now, for fight or flight, your body needs to get prepared. The adrenaline has to pump into your blood, all of that, and you also. So the reason why you have to get prepared, uh, the, the reason why your hands become moist is your body is actually warming up for a fight. The blood is coursing through your veins. The reason why you want to keep going to the loo again, it's it's fascinating. It's millions of years of genetic uh, programming. The genetic programming in our brain is telling us to empty our bowels before a fight because if we have feces inside our body during the fight, then in a fight, if we are injured, it can cause septicemia. Matter of fact, in the armed forces, just before we go into any sort of a combat uh, mission, if it is possible, of course. Everyone is supposed to take a shower and change their undergarments precisely for the same reason that if you get wounded, dirty clothing should not be the one that causes septicemia. And that's the reason why you keep wanting to go to the loo. The reason why your throat gets parched is because more blood needs to flow. So every drop of liquid is being taken out from the body and being pumped into the blood vessels. And why do you feel uh, butterflies in the stomach? You want to take a shot at it, Atul? Why do you get butterflies in the stomach? Not in your head, not in your hands. Why in the stomach? No idea. No idea. No idea. <laughs> so one of the activities that takes the maximum energy in a human body is digestion. And if you are going to go into a fight, every ounce of energy is required for that fight. So digestion has to stop. Now you are aware that the digestive enzymes in our stomach are acidic. So when the brain sends a signal into the gut brain, which is another brain that you have to stop all processing it releases basic enzymes. The basic enzymes reacting with the acidic enzymes is the butterflies in the stomach. Okay. Now that you know it, will you be able to stop it? Obviously not. You cannot stop it. But now that you know why it happens to you, next time you feel a little bit palpitated, you feel these butterflies in the stomach, you'll probably remember my story. You will have a smile on your face and you'll say, ah, I'm understanding. I'm not panicking. I'm understanding why this is happening and you will be much more in control. So to answer the question, can you do away with your bias? Because biases are nothing but stereotypes. Yeah. Biases are nothing but stereotypes. And stereotypes help us uh, navigate a world. It helps us make some broad decisions. It helps us if, if we have a opinion on certain things because you know these set formulas have worked in the past, but we should be conscious of it. So the only thing I urge is many times when I tell somebody that you will feel overwhelmingly convinced about a decision, give it a relook. Because as Atul, we were discussing, nothing is as good or as bad as it seems at first. If it seems like a fantastic decision to take, sleep over it. If it seems like a disastrous decision, sleep over that also. Because like I said, it's unlikely to be as good or as bad as you think. Thanks, Raghu. There's a question which is interesting. Uh, I mean, we get, keep getting asked this question. Uh, how low can the, the, the index fall? I mean, it's, uh, it's hypothetical. Um, and we say it can never become negative. Right. So the question is, uh, can I lose all my money? Uh, and we say no, because if you follow a process, and you believe in the Indian economy, it, the time will, and, you, and time is your friend, uh, as Warren Prophet has proven again and again. But uh, sort of the question is, uh, the fear, can I lose all my money? Uh, and hence, people put money in fixed deposits or under there. So uh, I'll pass the question on to you. Is there any chance that a person can lose all his money in mutual funds? Are there any incidents in the past, sir? <laughs> You're asking a soldier about money. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, I think sometimes we need to take a macro look at life, and I think it will help a lot if we take a macro look at life. One of the lessons uh, that COVID should leave us with is the fact that life is very fragile, and life is very very uh, you know uh, uh, life can turn anytime. So. In many ways, maybe we need to take a relook at wealth. What do we call wealth? Uh, what is wealth? 
Uh, to me, uh, a definition of wealth that I like very much is wealth is what you have left after all your money is gone. After you lost all your money, what you have got left is wealth. So if you have uh, uh, 20 friends whom you can reach out to and say, you know what, I'm in trouble and you can regenerate your, your you know, if you have skills uh, that can help you move from one profession to another, if you have goodwill that uh, will stand you in good stead, if you have a set of uh, relatives, if you have a set of relationships which will allow you to pass through that crisis stage, to my mind, that is real wealth. The other wealth, uh, Isaac Newton, Newton has also lost it. That brilliant man also has lost it. But he didn't lose his intellect. He didn't lose his and his legend, his legacy is not that he invested in South Sina Sea and lost his stocks. His legacy is he changed the way we think about the universe and all of that. So I would urge people who think about money as being the only component of wealth to redefine it. And yes, you can lose all your money in a mutual fund. You cannot lose your skill in a mutual fund. You cannot lose your relationships in a mutual fund. You cannot lose the goodwill in a mutual fund, unless, of course, you are a mutual fund advisor, in which case you will lose a lot of goodwill. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That is so, so, a fantastic. Uh, the, the point I'd like to add on that is that it's unlikely, I mean, to, to be realistic, to if you've invested well, you followed process, it's unlikely that in the long term, uh, you will lose all your money in mutual funds. Uh, like we are currently running a series called Freedom from Worry, which is what we're now talking about, that you focus on stuff you learned in the crisis period. Some people have picked up cooking, some people have learned to play the guitar, some people have taken up reading, uh, more motivational speakers, I'll leave the rest to us. Uh, this is our job, we do this for a living. Uh, we're reasonably confident that we can manage this well. So, yeah, to, to come back to the question, sort of uh, one question straight to you, Raghu. Uh, what do you do to look so energetic? Well, I'm not looking at this. All, it's all the lighting and the Botox, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and a question slightly aside. I mean, uh, obviously, you're a public speaker and, and, and a public figure. Uh, tell us any anecdotes over the last three months, four months. Uh, how have you kept yourself busy? Uh, and a little bit more about yourself right? well uh, uh, uh the last few months have been tough in many ways <clears throat> but uh, it also gave me an opportunity to do a lot of uh, reading a lot of uh, i would say introspection as well because uh, normally what happens is in our normally what happens in our life uh, in our regular life is uh, we have something called a cadence you know cadence is uh, you know, the beat to which a song is sung or the, the speed at which you live your life, you get out of work, go into office, get in the car, get in the car, go out there, meetings uh, before you, before you are entering into office, people are already meeting you and there's mails and decisions. Da, 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 da. So you're running your life literally in a staccato beat and then you pause on the weekend and then you repeat it again and you repeat it again. Uh, a phase like this, a compelled uh, uh, absistence from your normal routine allows you to take a relook at uh, what you're doing and allows you to ask yourself the basic fundamental questions that, uh, you know, is this, uh, I, I know I've been doing it out of habit, but is it something that I continue, I need to continue to do? Is it something that, so I think these pauses uh, give us that time. They, they give us that time. And and it, it was fascinating because today, before your this webinar, by the way, I sent this link uh, to many of my friends and, and I did not know there was a password. So all of them must be cursing me right now. But uh, one of them called me up before that. And uh, he's a gentleman who's retired from the civil services about uh, 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. So he must be easily about 70, 70 plus. And he was telling me that, you know, I've got this locked on and I've got this, you know, a Zoom installed in my this thing and all that. 70 year old man who's talking about Zoom, this, that. And he, he himself said it. He said this entire new space, you know, now I'm, I'm uh, talking to my grandkids and I'm doing this. Now, the technology existed earlier also. It was not the technology was not there, but that. The compellence which has forced us to relook at uh, some of the things that we sort of took for granted or some of the things that we just thought that's the only way to do stuff. I think this this opportunity of five months has uh, uh, given me me personally a little bit of uh, uh, sort of a reboot on the lack on the right side of the head to uh, relook at it uh, from that perspective. Um, I also believe uh, this is my personal belief that a lot of uh, leadership styles will have to change in, in, in as we go ahead. And there are two, three reasons for it. And um, I, I wanted to talk about it in a different uh, forum, but I think this is important to stress over here. 
what we are going to see uh, in the near future and of course i, I know that uh, in the long run the the indian uh, growth story is there but uh, you are aware that in the next few quarters we are uh, likely to see a little bit more of uh, uh, hiccups and uh, i think uh, we are not just looking at a economic collapse we are also looking at a social collapse we are also looking at masses and masses of our employees of our colleagues who will shift uh from being what is called a, a proletariat to a precariat uh, I'll, i'll define that a proletariat you're aware the people who have the ability to you know sort of form unions and protest and get their rights to a precariat precariat is a word which is a combination of precarious and proletariat so it conveys those masses of people whose jobs are literally on a day to day basis who don't know whether they'll have a job tomorrow who don't know whether they live in that uncertainty they will live in a very very high degree of uncertainty i was actually just talking to a company before this session began it's an mnc which very proudly told me that there is no question we are not laying off anybody now that hr leader who told me this he probably has the authority to say that for this month he doesn't know whether he himself will have a job next month now in that kind of an environment uh, a, a, a sort of a social uh, need to to reconnect we have to really look at it and i think um, i think uh, the, this 5 6 months has also emphasized the importance of relooking at the cadence of our life relooking at uh, whether we should be looking at only economic value or should we be looking at social value also one of happened i think which is a fantastic thing uh, not just for the indian uh, but especially for the indian uh, uh, environment is that mental health which used to be taboo and, and it's ironic it should be it used to be taboo because one in four uh, people in in india depending on the uh, age demography between one in four and one in six people uh, are suffering from a, a mental health issue and uh, it has always been considered to be a taboo issue and now suddenly it has come out into the open and i think that's something that's brilliant because uh, this has been an issue of of uh, uh, which has been pressing the average indian office goer uh, for the last uh, two decades almost uh this fear of uncertainty this appraisal every year uh this not knowing uh, competing in a rat race all of these things have have been applying pressure over a period of time and in a way the number of conferences where we are now talking about uh, uh, mental health actually it's the wrong phrase to use mental health because it's not uh, Uh, our brain that is broken it's our life that is broken it's our society that is broken so uh, in in many ways it uh, allows us to take a relook at that and i think that will be one of the silver linings of uh, this uh, crisis thank you so much uh, raghu i mean uh, so i'll try to just uh, sort of add my two pence worth in, in terms of from ask a box perspective uh, both to our employees who are listening in and to all our customers and some people who who dialed in because of uh the, the our fame personality on, on, on the call uh that yeah we, we believe for a follow process don't have biases i mean I, i really realize your biases uh be it in for the long term if you have fear if you have fear uh rationalize it uh, don't be don't be afraid of fear uh and and any i mean from our perspective we just like to thank you rahu so much for for so much energy uh so much insight uh an absolutely fantastic uh, leadership uh your in just in closing i'll hand it back to you to uh yeah your your last words to the to our audience uh, so uh, i know i i had a story that i wanted to share with you in my uh, presentation so i'll just narrate that story to you this is uh, the story of a man called uh, jim collins i've been uh, actually speaking uh, sorry jim stockdale i've been speaking about this uh, person uh, in the last few webinars that i've done because i think it's a very powerful story to remind ourselves uh, of it uh, uh, so <coughs> jim uh, Stockdale uh, was a fighter pilot. Uh, he was flying uh, for the US uh, uh, Air Force in the uh, uh, Vietnam War. And he was shot down over Hanoi on uh, I think September 1965. I'm forgetting the 23rd or 23rd of uh, September 1965. And uh, during ejection he got injured, he broke his leg. And some of you who studied uh, or are uh, or enthusiasts of uh, military history might be aware that uh, the Vietnam War was a very uh, bloody war i think all wars are bloody but it was a very very brutal war and prisoners on both sides were being tortured very very badly and so uh, when jim stockdale was captured he was uh, interned in the very very infamous howlow prison also known as the hanoi hilton if you've seen some of those movies of that time 
and he was tortured on a daily basis uh, for two reasons one of course he was uh, because he was an officer he was actually the senior most officer uh, in that prison camp who had been captured so he got uh, brunt of the anger of the viet cong and the second was because he was a very spirited person so he would constantly keep organizing uh, resistance and uh, stuff like that but extremely spirited man uh, so much so that uh, the viet cong wanted to parade him in front of cameras as a trophy and when he learned of that he took a stool and he beat his face until it became black and blue so that he could not be paraded in front because that would have you know sort of uh, that kind of a guy so anyway he suffers this torture uh, including solitary confinement for many many years of his uh, not for one year not for two years not for three years not for four, for seven and a half years he is inside prison seven and a half years and after the war is over and prisoners are repatriated he comes back uh, to the us and of course he is permanently injured in his leg and all of that but his spirit is undeterred and another jim uh, another very famous jim uh, james uh, uh, collins uh, interviewed him for a book called good to great which i'm sure you would have read that book uh, if you haven't you should read it in which uh, james collins uh, asks uh, james stockdale tell me something how is it that you were able to survive that ordeal not even knowing that there is an end to it so if you're incarcerated in prison for 10 years at least you got a bloody wall on which you can keep drawing the line ki chalo 10 saal baad i'll get out of here there is an end date to my torture here there is no end date matter of fact he's seeing prisoners uh, is is uh, other comrades dying he's seeing them dying uh, due to a wide variety of uh, issues so you you don't even have an end to this and it's so easy to give up so jim stockdale said something which was very very powerful i'll repeat it later at the end of the story he said that the fact that i am going to win in the end on that i had no doubt and because that's not a belief i could afford to give up but i would also not shy away from the fact that every day is a struggle and i will have to face the reality of that day through the day and then the next day so james talked the james colin asked him that tell me something tell me the people who didn't make it and he says it's very easy the people who didn't make it were the ones who were thinking that i'll get out of here by christmas and christmas came and went and they were still there they thought okay now i'll get out by new years new years came they were still there easter easter came still there and thanksgiving so eventually the next christmas came and this cycle continued and they died of a broken heart so jim stockdale made this statement which i want to read out to you and by the way jim stockdale went on to become uh, uh, the he almost became the vice president of the united states uh, he was the running mate of ross perot 1992 and uh, so of course he 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 read. so what he said is this uh, it's known as the stockdale paradox this this phrase that i'm uh, sharing with you this paragraph that uh, it's a very important lesson that we must never confuse faith that we will prevail in the end which we cannot ever afford to lose with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of our current reality whatever they might be this this sentence of the ability to retain faith that in the end we will prevail in the end the process will prevail in the end it will be okay and yet confront the harsh reality of a day to day basis when we can contain both these ideas in one head that stockdale paradox i think uh, should see us through not just this but pretty much any uh, crisis in our life and just as a reminder to all of us uh, each one of us i mean i've spent about a five decades all of us have spent each one of us has seen some major major crises in my life i mean it's not that we have not seen crises some of us have clawed our way out of uh, a deathbed some of us have we have seen a lot of crises all of, all of us have seen and and uh, that's part of our life so this is not something that should be you know uh, and the second aspect which i think we should remember is that each and every person who is here on this webinar who is listening to me belongs to 0.0000001% of indian humanity who have the right education who have the wherewithal who have imagine the millions of people who are suffering this and many many other crises in uh, in a daily basis and just look at them and look at ourselves and i think we'll be okay i think we will get that mojo back to say you know life is okay life is good we will handle it we will we'll go through thanks raghu i mean yeah uh, while uh, prepare for the worst but uh, hope for the best uh, this too shall pass we tell everybody uh, believe in the long term uh, the story in india india will grow uh, and if you are invested in india it will continue to be a beautiful story over the next 5 10 15 20 years us to do and yeah and we we should be thankful and grateful for the privilege we have uh, so thank you very much raghu 
Thanks uh, for that. Everything put... down out. It's been a privilege for us. Uh, and hope to catch you again sometime. Uh, we'll do that. For, we'll do that. Grow up. And thank you to the audience for taking time out. Uh, there's a small survey at, at the end of this. Uh, kindly do fill it up. It teaches us what we do. And thanks on, once again on behalf of Scriptbox. Uh, have a lovely weekend and be free from uh, uh, free from worry as far as possible. And and, and a great Independence Day. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully before investing.